Uh, good evening. I'm Gavin Cleesby, the Director of uh, Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society, and I'm well, uh, happy to welcome you uh, to our program on this beautiful uh, summer evening. Uh, the Massachusetts Historical Society is an independent nonprofit organization that maintains a research library with an amazing collection of material. We have the papers of three of the first six U.S. presidents, as well as papers from artists, mothers, soldiers, and protesters. We make our collections uh, available to researchers for free uh, and also host a wide variety of programs on Massachusetts and American history. We are only able to hope programs like this uh, thanks to the support of our members and donors. So if you're not a supporter of MHS, we hope you'll consider becoming a member uh, or making a donation. Uh, this evening, we'll hear from Karen Weintraub and Michael Kucha on their new book, Born in Cambridge. This the book explores some of the many Cambridge firsts, such as the first college, first printing press, first sewing machine, first long distance phone call, first email message, first same sex marriage license, uh, as well as some of the less glamorous firsts, like the first microwave oven and the first highlighter and the first frozen orange juice container. Um, as a person who's born in Cambridge, I can say that this is a book that, of course, speaks to me mostly about the highlighter. Uh, Karen Weintraub uh, is a journalist and is now working as a health reporter at USA Today. Uh, her work appears in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Scientific, Scientific America, and uh, STAT, STAT. STAT. Okay. Um, and she is the co-author of The Autism Re Revolution and Fast Minds. Uh, Michael Kucha is an architect and campus, campus planner, uh, and please join me in welcoming them. Thanks so much. Um, thank you for those of you in the room and um, for those online as well for joining us and thanks to Gavin and Olivia for, for hosting us and, and setting this up. Uh, we're really excited to share our book, Born in Cambridge, um, which has been a labor of love for us for about seven years. Um, and I'm going to start by reading some of the book's preface, uh, which lays out our reasons for writing the book, its conceit and its structure. And then Mike is going to talk um, about one of our favorite spots in the city, uh, a place that encapsulates so much of the city's innovative history and potential. Then we'll each talk about a topic from the book, um, something we, we didn't know about before we started this project. Uh, we've fallen in love with most of the stories that we tell here, but thought that these would give you at least a flavor of the range and the breadth um, of what's happened in Cambridge over the last four centuries. Um, we'll also have a few slides to help you picture what we're, what we're talking about. Um, so here goes, I, I, as I said, I'm going to read the preface if you'd like to follow along. Um, so we've now lived in Cambridge for more than 20 years, taking long walks and carting our daughters throughout, throughout the city's neighborhoods. Over the years, reading historical plaques and talking to our neighbors, we began keeping a mental list of firsts that happened here. As Gavin said, the first college in the English colonies, the first mustering of the U.S. Army, the first garden cemetery, Mount Auburn, the first two-way long-distance phone call, the first legal same-sex marriage. Our adopted city has also been home, at least for key points in their lives, to television chef Julia Child, civil rights leader and sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois, photography pioneer Edwin Land, and poet Robert Lowell. We've short stories about each of these in our book. As we expanded our list of innovative Cambridge people and ideas, we knew we would need to make some hard choices. Harvard and MIT alone have connections to hundreds of Nobel Prize winners. We realized we couldn't write individual profiles of each of them, nor about the incredible students who sat through lectures here or others who passed through town. So we decided we needed to limit our list, if only to preserve our own sanity, uh, to fewer than 50 subjects. To do this, we established some fairly tight constraints. Um, each topic had to be an innovation we could credibly argue had important beginnings in the city of Cambridge. So you actually mentioned um, orange juice container, the frozen orange juice might have been started in Cambridge, but we couldn't confirm it. So we uh, <laughs> do not have that one actually in the book. Um, and, and we've laid claim to the development of microwave radar, but not the microwave oven, even though some of the technology overlaps. Um, we decided to focus on developments that we'd heard of and were part of our daily lives, rather than advances within specific fields. Uh, we included the yellow highlighting marker and baking powder uh, while leaving out <laughs> while leaving out sociable robots and self-assembling monolayers, which is a thing. Um, we looked for stories that would engage readers in the complex personalities and processes of discovery that have long made, made Cambridge an interesting place. Many of these advances are connected to Harvard and MIT, of course, but one of the things that surprised us was the number of important innovations that occurred in Cambridge outside of academia. What we ended up with is not a conventional history of a city. We've tried to view Cambridge through its innovators rather than its political or community leaders. 
So our story is deliberately episodic. Uh, there wasn't much going on here in the 18th century. So um, Cambridge had a tiny population and a limited influence on the world. So we don't have a lot in that era. Although Cambridge has clearly been enriched throughout its history by waves of immigration, we also haven't focused specifically on the city's cultural history. Some of our subjects, like, oops, I don't know if you can see this, W.E.P. Du Bois were visionaries. Most were exceptionally passionate, and a few were seriously misguided, uh, at least by today's standards. Um, some have become household names, while others are virtually unknown today. The common thread is that we found all of them interesting and worthy of exploration. And one thing that struck us again and again in working on this book is how the story of Cambridge reflects the history of America. Cambridge was one of the earliest communities settled by English colonists in the 1600s. When the country was divided over slavery in the mid 1800s, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was holding long conversations with abolitionists in his Cambridge living room. When World War II threatened, the city's scientists, engineers, and factory workers mobilized to develop important technologies like radar and made candy for the nation's soldiers and sailors, while other families sent their children off to fight. For each of the subjects we chose to explore, we poured over biographies, journal articles, and archival records. We interviewed people who could bring the stories to life or add a modern day perspective. And we sought out visual materials. This, by the way, is the pile in our still in our basement. Um, <laughs> and we sought out visual materials that would connect our stories to the places where they happened. As our list of topics grew and morphed, some general categories emerged. So we have different chapters on literature, social reform, industry, basic science, national defense, the digital world, biotechnology, and pop culture, things like the movie Love Story, if you're old enough to remember that. Um, and uh, so we wrote about vaccine innovator Benjamin Waterhouse and 19th century feminist and journalist Margaret Fuller, pioneering educator Mariah Baldwin, more on her in a bit, as well as the origins of the first sewing machine, the Fig Newton, the electronic spreadsheet, and Napalm, and of course the Car Talk guys. Uh, as our list began to grow, it raised larger questions for us. How has the city of never more than 125,000 people been the scene of so much innovation? And how has it managed to thrive and reinvent itself while so many American cities have struggled to stay afloat? This book represents our attempts at answers. Now Mike's gonna talk about 700 Main Street, a nondescript building that illustrates some of the things we find compelling about Cambridge. Thank you, Karen, and thank you all of you who are assembled here uh, in person or virtually. Um, so the image in front of us is an image of a factory that once existed on Main Street in Cambridge, uh, about halfway between Kendall Square and Central Square. The building was built around 1842 for a company called the Davenport and Bridges Company. It was the leading railroad car manufacturer in the United States at that time. And they invented something called the Center Isle Rail Car, which you might expect, had a center aisle with seats on either side. This was apparently a, an innovation in, in rail uh, car manufacturing, and they became the leading uh, manufacturer of uh, rail cars in, in the US. Uh, but then, uh, and just to look at this image for a second, you can see in the background the Charles River, basically, this uh, factory was nearly at the edge of the river at that time, and today you would see the MIT campus, which was built on fill uh, that was dredged from the river and then uh, placed behind an embankment by the same man, Charles Davenport, who founded this uh, railroad company. Uh, in the 1850s, Davenport sold the factory to another company, and they rented it out to another company called the Walworth Company and they manufactured steam heating systems. Um, Walworth employed a man named Daniel Stilson, who had served as a mechanic on a Navy ship in the Civil War. And in 1869, Stilson inv invented the adjustable pipe wrench, which I have a, a small example of here. Um, it uh, became known as the Stilson wrench, and it's, uh, it vastly improved the ability of plumbers to tighten pipes, and they could do it with one hand because of the nature of its self-ratcheting head. Stilson received a patent for the wrench, uh, which he then licensed to his employer, the Walworth Company, which then manufactured pipe wrenches for many decades, and it became a, you know, a household name in the plumbing industry. Uh, but the Walworth plant uh, played another key role uh, in another innovation, which is the first long-distance phone call. 
Alexander Graham Bell, who was uh, teaching uh, speech at Boston University and he was an amateur inventor, had been working on the design of the telephone at his Boston laboratory. And of course, the famous story is the conversation he has with his assistant, uh, Thomas Watson. Uh, Mr. Watson, come here, I want you. But really to be useful, the telephone has to work more than just between two adjacent rooms. Um, it has to work over long distances. And so for Bell to test whether it was going to work, this invention of his, he and Watson used an existing telegraph line that ran from Walworth's Boston headquarters across the river to its Cambridge manufacturing plant. So Thomas Watson was positioned at the Cambridge end of the wire, which was at the 700 Main Street site. Uh, both men took notes on the words that they said and then the words that they heard. And then back in the lab, they compared notes. So this was the site of the first real demonstration of the usefulness of the telephone, which obviously revolutionized communications sort of globally in the centuries since. But wait, there's more, as they say. Uh, in 1882, the Walworth building was torn down, and the building that we see in this image was built. For a while, it was home to a furniture manufacturer, which in 1940 leased it. Um, or at least a part, portion of it to a man named Edwin Land. And Land used it as a laboratory for his experiments in light polarization, which helps reduce glare and things like sunglasses and photographic lenses. And it's in this building that Land invented the Polaroid camera and the entire field of instant photography. The famous story is that in 1943, Land was on vacation in Santa Fe, New Mexico, taking family photographs when his three-year-old daughter asked, why can't I see the photograph now? That got his brain working and he sort of methodically went through the steps that would be required to make an instant camera system. A short five years later, on Thanksgiving day in 1948, or Thanksgiving weekend, the Polaroid company introduced his camera and film system at the Jordan Marsh department store in downtown Boston. It was the consumer product sensation of the year. Jordan Marsh, sold out of its uh, supply of cameras that very same day. They cost something like $89 each, which you can imagine was quite a bit of money in 1948. But it was sort of the iPod, the iPhone, the iPad wrapped up all into one in the sort of post-World War II era, increasingly prosperous Americans who had money to burn, uh, you know, spent it on things like instant photography and the Polaroid camera took off. A dozen years later, Polaroid sales reached $100 million a year. The story of Polaroid goes in different directions. It uh, really expanded its footprint and its hiring in, in the city of Cambridge and really in Massachusetts uh, more broadly. At the same time, when much of the, the state and the city's industry was, was leaving, leaving for suburbs, leaving for you know, the South. And so it was a time when people were concerned that the city of Cambridge and other industrial cities um, would really have no future. So Polaroid by expanding in this period of time in the 1960s was really became a bright spot in the local economy. Its first sepia tone films were followed by true black and white, and then finally by color. And then in 19, the 1970s, they invented a, a camera called the SX-70, which was a sort of all in one uh, uh, integral film system so that you didn't have to peel apart uh, the film pieces you had in kind of the previous systems. Anyway, their sales grew uh, explosively. Uh, unfortunately, the company faced competition from one hour photo processing and then later, later from digital photography. Uh, and really what brought it down was an instant movie camera that uh, Land had developed in the 1970s that turned out to be a commercial failure. And he stepped down from the company's uh, chairmanship in 1982. Fast forward a couple decades in 2001, Polaroid filed for bankruptcy and largely uh, left Cambridge behind. And that might have been the end for the story of 700 Main Street and potentially for the city's workforce and its future. But as luck would have it, MIT bought the building, renovated it, and in 2013, an organization called Lab Central took over 700 Main Street. Lab Central is a biotechnology incubator that's supported by the state government, by MIT itself, and by philanthropic funding. And it serves to help entrepreneurs who want to start companies in biotechnology. 
So they offer not only the sort of office space and administrative support that young entrepreneurs need, but also the expensive lab equipment that it would be expensive for a lot of uh, you know, young starting out companies to purchase, uh, like PCR machines that are used in genetic testing. So this building, 700 Main Street, now has a new life. And just possibly it will produce the next you know, Moderna vaccine or some other innovation that will change the world. And in the process, help Cambridge and this whole region to thrive economically. So to us, this building, 700 Main Street, you know, people have passed by it, you know, every day and have no idea the sort of layers of history that have occurred there. Uh, and we really think it's just a remarkable place. Uh, and so we really wanted to talk about it as a way that, uh, you know, it represents sort of, again, these layers of history, but also the way that Cambridge, its, its, its economy and the Boston region have been able to reinvent uh, themselves uh, over the centuries. Uh, and, uh, you know, everyone's used a telephone, every plumber has had uh, used some of these wrenches. And so the innovations born there really have had a uh, sort of global impact. Um, I think at this point, Karen is going to talk about a different aspect of Cambridge history. Yes. So I want to yep. talk about Mariah Baldwin, who was principal of the Baldwin School. Um, and uh, for about 20 years ago, Cambridge renamed this elementary school after her. Uh, before that, it had been named after somebody else we talk about in our book, uh, who has a <clears throat> more question, spottier past, shall we say, uh, named Louis Agassiz, uh, which we can talk about later if anybody's interested. Um, but uh, Baldwin was literally born in Cambridge. Sometimes uh, we use that term metaphorically, but like Gavin, she was born in Cambridge. Um, and uh, the daughter of a postal worker of Haitian descent. Um, she grew up and was educated in Cambridge, but as a black woman, she didn't have a lot of job prospects. So after teacher's college, she went to Maryland to, to take her first job. In the early 1880s, she was hired to teach essentially as a substitute teacher at the Baldwin, what was then called the Agassiz School, um, quickly rose to full-time teacher and taught nearly every grade before being named the school's principal in 1889, a job she would hold for the next 33 years. The student body and other faculty were almost entirely white at the Baldwin School, um, and she was the only black principal of a white school, we think in the Northeast and maybe the whole country of, of uh, an integrated school at the time, certainly one of the few. In 1917, sociologist and civil rights activist W.E. Du, ah, w. E. du Bois featured Baldwin in his Man of the Month column uh, in the journal The Crisis. He noted that Miss, quote, Miss Baldwin, without a doubt, occupies the most distinguished position achieved by a person of Negro descent in the teaching world of America, outside cities where there are segregated schools. Baldwin was an innovative educator. She hired the city's first school nurse. She created a parent teacher group. She designed new ways to teach math and science. She helped rebuild the school building in 1916, shaping the architectural plans. She insisted on open air classrooms, an assembly hall, and a science museum, which at the time was, were all pretty innovative. Um, the school also expanded to eight grades under her leadership, and she was named master of the school, which is like a step up from principal. Um, she was also beloved. The poet E.E. E. Cummings, who grew up on Irving Street, not far from the school uh, and attended all the way through, once wrote about Baldwin, quote, never did any demi-divine dictator more gracefully and easily rule a more unruly and less graceful populace. Her very presence emanated an honor and a glory. Baldwin also apparently led a double life as a leading member of the region's black intelligentsia at the turn of the 20th century, a time known as the nadir for the horrific treatment of African-Americans. According to her biographer, Kathleen Weiler, who's a longtime Tufts education professor, Baldwin was a quiet advocate for racial equity and social justice. She held weekly meetings um, at her home on Prospect Street, which is still there. It's, sorry, that half, the left half as you're looking at it, uh, of the building. Um, still looks very much like this. Um, and to avoid attention from people uh, opposed to racial, racial equality, many early civil rights advocates got together under the guise of literary, social, or religious organizations. So Baldwin's literary events might have, been, might have masked this larger social purpose. In any case, we know they attracted people like Du Bois and newspaper editor William Monroe Trotter, both of whom would go on to co-found the Niagara Movement, which would essentially become the NAACP. 
Baldwin was apparently a powerful speaker, although none of her speeches were transcribed, uh, so we, we have no evidence of them. Um, and people commented about her that she spoke without bitterness, that she was an optimistic person, had, a, had an upbeat view of life, despite uh, obviously not, not seeing through rose-colored glasses. Um, we have one short essay of hers that, that exists from 1900 called The Changing Ideal of Progress in which he wondered whether the drive for personal improvement, so one's own advancement, came at the expense of societal progress. Quietly but surely, she wrote, there is growing a social consciousness. All the activities of life are being profoundly influenced by the deepening sense of the oneness of the human race. Ever stronger sets the tide of feeling against isolation, against segregation of lives and of interests. And I think this quote really illustrates a point we try to make in our last chapter, where we tried to draw some larger themes from the stories that we tell. People like Baldwin were working for, were innovating for the greater good, not just for their own personal advancement. They valued intellectual and creative achievements. And that's a theme that we found popping up a lot uh, in throughout Cambridge's four centuries of history. Um, so now Mike is going to take us forward into the, I guess, the more recent past uh, through a quick history of computing in Cambridge and one man whose idea transformed and maybe even created the digital world. Um, so this is a, a view of East Cambridge uh, in 1879, looking uh, toward the Charles River in the distance and what would essentially be the Kendall Square area. Uh, which uh, is uh, in the photograph mostly uh, a combination of wetlands, uh, riverfront, and uh, a few buildings. In any case, uh, in 2020, which was sort of when we wrote the, the bulk of the manuscript of this book, uh, Kendall Square uh, housed one of the densest concentrations of computer application developers anywhere in the world. So Amazon has Cambridge employees uh, working on audiobooks. Uh, down the street, Apple engineers were focused on speech recognition. Google coders worked on YouTube and the Android phone system. IBM researchers were working on artificial intelligence. And Microsoft's Cambridge teams advanced its Office 365 productivity suite and cloud computing. With MIT frequently ranking as the top undergraduate computer science program in the country and Harvard not far behind, it's hardly surprising that Cambridge has become a center for software development. But what we found interesting when we started doing a little research for the, the book on the computer industry was how many early pioneers in computing have connections to Cambridge and how fundamental some of the, their contributions have been to the way we now experience the digital age. So we're starting uh, with the images here of one of the earliest computer pioneers, a man named Van Iver Bush. He was an MIT electrical engineering professor in the 1920s and 30s. He co-founded the defense giant Raytheon, which was in the news this week uh, for moving to Maryland. Uh, but uh, Bush was also a science policy advisor to the federal government during the 1940s uh, and 1950s, most critically during World War II. In 1927, Bush invented an analog computer, so it didn't have digital circuitry to it, uh, at MIT called the Differential Analyzer, which you can see a portion of in this uh, photograph. It was um, used to solve differential equations, which are used in calculus to you know, determine, say, the area of a, under a curve. Uh, and um, Bush, this, oops, this comes up uh, in, in a few minutes uh, with another person he influenced named Claude Shannon, who was actually hired to operate this machinery. Uh, anyway, jumping back to Bush, he served as Franklin Roosevelt's chief scientific advisor during World War II, and in that role, he oversaw the Manhattan Project, which developed atomic weapons, and the development of microwave radar systems at the MIT Radiation Lab. So he's sort of one of the earliest people who we can claim uh, uh, as a, a computing pioneer in the city of Cambridge. So moving a few decades forward, uh, this is a photograph of a man named Ray Tomlinson. He worked at a Cambridge-based uh, company called Bolt, Baranek, and Newman in, in 1971 when he sent the very first email using the at symbol. It was a, the first system uh, that he developed was it was the first system that was able to send mail between users on 
two different computers. So when you think about Alexander Graham Bell, innovation was sending between two cities. This was, uh, you know, sending between two different computers, which hadn't been possible before his innovation. And he essentially created the standards for all emails that have been sent ever since. He was actually um, working on communication protocols for the ARPANET, which was the early implementation of what we now call the internet. Uh, and the email project he worked on was a, a bit of a side project. He wasn't really supposed to be working on it. And so uh, he told people, you know, don't people, don't tell anyone I've, I've done this. Uh, needless to say, over time, it became one of the most useful uh, uh, reasons to have uh, network computing. Our next Cambridge-based pioneer, um, this is a photograph of a man named Mitch Caper, uh, who uh, developed a, a spreadsheet program called Lotus 123. Uh, he actually had didn't invent the electronic spreadsheet, but that honor goes to a Harvard Business School student named Dan Bricklin, who um, invented a spreadsheet to help his business school uh, case studies uh, in, in, in school. He got tired of erasing the blackboard and writing more things. So right. it's like, how can I do this better? So uh, Dan Bricklin formed a company called VisiCalc. It had its headquarters in Central Square, and it created what was considered the first killer application for the newly released Apple personal computer. Um, there was a quote, uh, Steve Jobs uh, uh, was being interviewed, uh, and he once mentioned that if you know, VisiCalc hadn't existed for the Apple II, that the Apple II would not have become a popular machine and you would be talking to someone else instead of Steve Jobs. Um, so um, Mitch Caper, who had worked uh, with Dan Bricklin, uh, saw an opportunity to create an improved spreadsheet program for the IBM personal computer, which came out around uh, in the early 80s. And he founded a company in Cambridge called Lotus Development Corp which very quickly dominated the spreadsheet market and became a major local employer. Uh, though Lotus eventually lost out to Microsoft Excel, the idea of the spreadsheet that Dan Bricklin and Mitch Caper created is now, of course, a ubiquitous computer application. And then I have a, just a couple more examples of uh, Cambridge-based innovation in the digital sphere. Uh, in the late 1970s, three young MIT professors invented a practical way to keep information private as it was passed from one computer to another. Uh, it's called public key cryptography. Uh, so basically, uh, it involves sending, well, it's, a, a, it's complicated uh, to describe uh, briefly, but essentially allowed two people who hadn't previously uh, had a relationship with each other uh, to share information confidentially. Uh, and it was a practical enough system that it could operate on the kind of computers of the 1980s, which obviously didn't have the kind of processing power that computers have today. And it serves this concept of public key cryptography as the basis of all e-commerce. So every time you, you give a credit card number over the internet, you're using this function. Uh, anytime you access a, a website with HTTPS, uh, the S indicates that it's a secure connection, and that's established by this communications uh, and cryptographic protocol that was established by these three uh, MIT professors in the late 1970s. And then one, one last one. Um, this is a photograph of a woman named Robin Chase, uh, who was a co-founder of Zipcar, the uh, car sharing company that started in Cambridge. Uh, and was really one of the pioneers in what is generally called the sharing economy. So today we think about companies like Uber or Airbnb, where you can share the use of your car or the share the use of your you know, apartment to rent out. And none of that existed in 2000 when Robin Chase and her, her uh, business partner, Angie Danielson, founded Zipcar. They realized they could use uh, both the internet and cell phone technology to create an, a new way of, of renting uh, vehicles for short-term use. And they found a ready market in, in Cambridge and Boston where they knew people would be willing to adopt the technologies that they were, that they were uh, developing. Uh, you didn't explain the, the Oh, picture. sorry. The, the photograph uh, on the right is the, um, 
coffee house in Central Square where they held their first meeting. So that's sort of where Zipcar was born. So with, with those sort of, we, we've written sort of longer pieces about each of those innovators uh, in our book, but we have one more person we wanted to talk about with relation to the computer industry. And this is a man named Claude Shannon. Uh, I'm going to take a drink of water for a second here. So today we're surrounded by digital devices, computers, cell phones, televisions, household appliances, cameras, you know, the list seems endless, right? But as re recently as a century ago, the only common digital device was a light switch. A light switch has two states of being, it's either on or it's off. And no one imagined that the light switch could carry data until an MIT graduate student named Claude Shannon published his master's thesis in 1938. Shannon argued that a set of a mathematical equations called Boolean algebra could be modeled in electrical circuitry in a series of switches that are either on or off. And his observation became a fundamental um, element of what we now know as the digital age. Uh, the primary means at that time of transmitting information long distance, such as the telephone and the radio, relied on what's called analog transmission, which is the manipulation of continuous electromagnetic waves. Shannon ended up developing a completely new idea of how information could be transmitted. He had arrived at MIT uh, in 1936 from the University of Michigan, where he studied electrical engineering and math. And he was influenced by the 19th century English mathematician and logician named George Boole. In Boole's math, every statement could be represented as either true or false. Shannon applied his logical states to electrical circuits. So true is on, which means a completed electrical circuit, and false is off, which is a disrupted electrical circuit. So he, uh, Shannon, while he was working on his master's degree at MIT, he worked in the lab of Vannevar Bush, uh, operating the differential analyzer. And so he had this idea of a, of a mechanical computer, and he thought, well, this could be implemented through electronic means or through the use of, of electric means of on and off elements. The differential analyzer uh, had an arrangement of gears and metal shafts and pulleys that were cumbersome. They took an, an, up an entire room and it, the machine had to be completely reconfigured for each problem it was asked to, to solve. So he saw these parallels between what that machine was trying to do and the electrical circuitry that he had uh, learned about in his studies. Um, and he realized that, uh, again, he could model complex logical statements with electrical switches. So his master's thesis, a symbolic analysis of relays and switching circuits, contained ideas that were startlingly new when they were published in 1938. Uh, a mathematician at Princeton called his thesis one of the most important master's theses ever written, a landmark in that it changed circuit design from an art to a science. And he was just 22 years old when he wrote this. Um, but his ideas form the fundam fundamental concepts behind all digital devices, whether they're made of transistors or microchips or vacuum tubes. And really, it was in the decade after his paper that some of the first digital computers were invented, a few of which, uh, in, uh, were in Cambridge. So uh, in 1944, IBM built something called the Mark I, which was an electromechanical calculator that was installed at Harvard uh, to do calculations for the military, like uh, artillery trajectories and things like that. Uh, at MIT, there was a, a pioneering computer called Whirlwind, which began operation in 1951 and was eventually uh, used for uh, uh, radar and air traffic control systems. So Shannon uh, ended up leaving MIT uh, during World War II. He worked at Bell Labs in New York City uh, and had another conceptual breakthrough, which was he realized that any form of communication, whether a love letter, an audio transmission, a photograph, a movie, any, any form of communication could be modeled uh, in ones and zeros in the on and off switches of his master's thesis. And he called these binary digits or bits. Um, and by converting information to these digital bits, 
He believed that uh, information could be transmitted flawlessly without the noise, like the static in a radio transmission, that had always plagued analog uh, transmission. So when they were trying to uh, get information through an undersea cable from uh, Washington to uh, London, you know, a lot of the problem was that that you could make the signal louder, but it also made the noise louder. And so he was really working through the kind of fundamentals of, of communications when he was trying to solve some of these uh, more immediate war needs. Uh, in 1956, Shannon accepted a visiting professorship at MIT, and he de delivered a series of well-attended lectures and joined the faculty the following year, spending the rest of his career at MIT. Um, his, his sort of genius was he looked at uh, complex problems and tried to find the simplest way to solve them. He wasn't so much interested in practical applications as in addressing sort of what fundamental issues um, they represented. Uh, he didn't write much. He never was much of a promoter of his own ideas. And I think he, you know, didn't become a household name in, in ways that perhaps he, he should be. Um, but um, at MIT, he was much beloved. He gained a reputation for his eccentric hobbies, including unicycling, juggling, and chess. Uh, and he loved to build toys. So the, one of his most famous toys, we have this image, uh, it was a machine that consisted of a mechanical hand and a gearing mechanism. And when the switch to the machine was turned on by someone's hand, the mechanical hand would come out and shut off the switch. Um, it was a you know Pointless. completely useless machine, but but nonetheless clever. Toward the end of his life, Shannon suffered from Alzheimer's, uh, and although there were computers in his home, according to his wife, he never realized the digital revolution he had spawned. That was not something he was capable of of kind of comprehending at that point. He died in two thousand one, and he is buried uh, in. Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge. That I think is the end of our formal presentation. Um, we covered a lot of ground in our book and we probably covered a lot of ground uh, tonight, but if you have questions, we are happy to take them. Thank you very much. And um, so if we have questions online, um, if anyone in the audience has a question, we can also uh, handle that. Uh, I can start us off. Um, sure. So one thing that I find sort of interesting about innovations in Cambridge is the uh, number of them that are supported by the government. And I think that that's often commonly missed. Uh, and I don't know if you have any sort of uh, reflections on the influence that the government, particularly the military, has had on Cambridge innovations. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'd say particularly uh, since World War II, when the, the MIT Radiation Lab was established as part of, you know, the federal government's uh, war effort generally, uh, and uh, was funded as a civilian research effort, as opposed to sort of the military research efforts, which traditionally had been funded by government. So it um, was a sort of a pioneering in this creation of what we now maybe call the military industrial academic complex, but nonetheless uh, spurred a lot of the, the, the government funding for academic research. And in fact, uh, Van Iver Bush, uh, who we talked about, was uh, uh, when he left MIT, he went to Washington, D.C., and he was very influential in the creation of the National Science Foundation, which is obviously a conduit for government funding of basic research at academic institutions. And for sure, um, that has had played a, a major role in, in certainly the second half of the 20th century. Um, but a lot of the innovations that we talked about are a product of sort of just the industrial uh, activity of Cambridge. So, you know, Cambridge uh, from the 1840s was a center of brick making. It was making glass in the 18 teens. Uh, it really was a, a diversified industrial center. Uh, the Little Brown Company had their publishing uh, plant, and uh, the Houghton Mifflin plant was also, you know, in Cambridge. So there was a, a really a diverse set of industrial businesses, and some of them were quite innovative. So not all of, uh, you know, the the sort of innovation comes from 
government sources, but for sure, uh, a lot of it has, and, and again, certainly in more recent decades. We have a few questions online. Um, the first one is, can you tell us more about the Rumford baking powder in front of you? <laughs> oh, sure. Um, so yes, I, I brought a little prop with me. Um, uh, first of all, eBay is an amazing resource, not to plug eBay, but um, it's a great resource to find uh, uh, things, uh, history. Actually, Charlie Sullivan at the Cambridge Historical uh, Commission uh, tipped me off to uh, the fact that he often scours eBay for um, for historical relics. So, so the story of the Rumford uh, baking powder can um, uh, is that there was a, a Harvard chemistry professor in the 1840s uh, named Eben Horsford, uh, and he was very interested in basically agricultural chemistry. So improving the food sources that Americans needed to survive. You know, today we we think that food is a plentiful resource or in many parts of the country it is, but in those days, just basically feeding yourself, you know, was, was a more challenging thing. And so he applied his scientific knowledge to improving uh, uh, food supply. So one of the things that he did investigations of was, was baking. So there are two ways to, to produce leavening in, in uh, flour to produce bread. One is with yeast, and yeast can be is a natural product and it can be unreliable you don't know if the strains of yeast you're getting today are going to produce the same volume of bread as you know the ones the loaves you make tomorrow or at least certainly in those days you didn't so uh, 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 horsford invented this baking powder which is composed of three basic elements a weak acid which uh, he derived from uh, the bones of cows that had been treated with sulfuric acid uh, with baking soda, uh, sodium bicarbonate, which is a base. And then the third ingredient is, is um, cornstarch, and that's basically a desiccant. It keeps the two active ingredients, the, the acid and the base, from reacting with each other prematurely. So basically, they, you keep your powder dry, as it were, <laughs> um, in this case, before you need it. And the beauty of baking powder is a purely chemical reaction. So you can measure, you know, the same amount of, of ingredients will cause the same amount of leavening. And so consistency in baking was a, a you know, a real advantage of having uh, baking powder. So he was the Count Rumford professor uh, at, at Harvard, uh, at the Lawrence Scientific School at the time, uh, and he, um, he built a fortune out of this invention. They built a factory uh, in outside of Providence, Rhode Island, uh, and the, the company has been, you know, bought out. The factory in Rhode Island no longer serves to make baking powder, but the the brand still exists. And Horsford himself is a very interesting uh, uh, character. Wow. He was uh, of uh, Norwegian ancestry, and he was convinced that Leif Erikson had founded America in the year 1000. If you're ever walking on Memorial Drive in Cambridge outside of Mount Auburn Hospital, there's a small uh, uh, plaque, a uh, stone plaque next to the sidewalk. It's an area very few people walk, but that uh, he placed there because he was uh, to commemorate the landing of Leif Erikson uh, at that intersection. Now, there is no other historical evidence that Leif Erikson landed in Watertown or Cambridge, uh, but, uh, you know, Horsford had uh, a lot of influence and a lot of money, and he, there's actually a statue of him right nearby on, I guess, Commonwealth Avenue, uh, and, uh, you know, he was a very interesting local figure. I have to say that I'm, I'm vaguely obsessed with Horsford, uh, but one of the great things about the marker for the site of Leif Erikson's house is that it isn't actually where Horsford placed it. Uh, uh, MDC, which was the predecessor to DCR, uh, when they expanded uh, Memorial Drive, uh, they went over the spot where the original marker had been. Um, and this was in the very early days of the Cambridge Historical Commission, and they uh, advocated to save the plaque and originally the plaque sat on sort of a low indentation and there was a, a wrought iron fence that went around it that marked the, the corner posts of the of the site. 
or the supposed site. Uh, and so they moved it about a thousand feet. So not only is it crazy, <laughs> but it's also in the wrong place. Right, right, right. That's good. Uh, we have another question asking about missed chances for innovation. Um, they're asking about, they heard about NASA maybe having an opportunity to be in Kendall Square. And they're also asking if you think that Cambridge is better off with biotech and everything that is all the innovation there now. Colby, no, you get it. Um, so the, the, I guess the, the, the story of the Volpe site is, is complex and uh, you know, it was originally uh, going to be a NASA facility uh, and uh, well, that didn't sort of work out. Kennedy died. Uh, and it became a, a transportation research center. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't really know. Uh, it's hard to say what, what might have happened um, there, but that site is now being developed. And one of the things that we talk about in the book is how the demise of industry actually provided an opportunity for biotech, for instance. So. Um, there are uh, the the Neco factory, uh, Neco wafer factory is now home to Novartis, for instance, because the large floor plans, high ceilings, sturdy buildings work for bio, heavy biotech machinery. So, in a sense, the the Volpe site and the fact the fact that that neighborhood never got developed left it undeveloped at a time when the biotech industry was exploding and provided opportunities. So, it's hard to say what would have happened otherwise, but but it has. The silver lining has been this opportunity for biotech to expand. Um, we so did we did write in our book though uh, about sort of the um, the biosafety uh, debate that occurred in Cambridge uh, during the 1970s. So Harvard was intending to build uh, a, a research laboratory that was going to do some genetic engineering or genetic research, and there was outcry in the community about you know. Are we going to be breeding, you know, dangerous uh, germs that are going to kill us all? And is there any public oversight of, of this effort? So Cambridge actually established a public uh, committee to establish policies for safely doing genetics research. And although it was seen at the time as something that might, you know, stop the genetics uh, research altogether, it actually fostered it by creating a sort of a regularized uh, uh, a regulatory Predictable. framework for doing genetics research. So if you were going to build a, a, a new genetics you know, a research lab, you wanted to do it in Cambridge because you knew what the rules were versus if you did it in, in other places. And that was sort of the germ of, of the biotechnology industry uh, in, in Cambridge uh, and had sort of unintended consequences. I would just sort of add that Cambridge has a, a very long history of unintended consequences. <laughs> uh, and of course, the biotech debate or the um, um, genetically altered uh, DNA debate uh, was really launched by former uh, mayor. mayor slash city councilor Al Volucci, who is just a fabulous character. Uh, <laughs> and if you ever have the chance to just search his name in the, the Harvard Crimson archives, you'll find amazing <laughs> stories. He wanted to pave Harvard Yard and make it into a parking lot. Um, <laughs> he had all sorts of great plans. He claimed that one of Harvard's uh, School of Education building, which has sort of a recessed first floor, was actually going to have a moat with alligators in it. I mean, it, he was a, a master of political theater uh, in some of the craziest ways. Um, but also the clearing of, of Kendall Square created this gigantic open space, which created all the space once that, that property started coming online. Um, so I think that it's sort of fascinating how much of these great innovations have often been spurred in some ways by unintended consequences. So. <laughs> right, so like where Moderna's headquarters are uh, currently, although they're building a new facility, um, you know, it was on the site of the, the Lever Brothers Soap Factory which closed uh, in around 1950. Uh, and, you know, MIT and, uh, eventually got involved in the site and uh, Cavett and Forbes, a big developer, got involved in the site and they created the complex now known as Technology Square, where a whole lot of it really interesting things have happened. But that was not a linear path, let's just say. Uh, David is asking if you can say more about uh, NECO. Neko? About Neko. We miss it. <laughs> I guess um, I, my favorite is the clove flavor. I, uh, maybe I don't know if that was addressing the question directly, but um, uh, 
so the the Neko company started actually in, in Boston. There's a, a Neko Street uh, in Four Point Channel, um, uh, and they moved to Cambridge in the 1920s, building the factory on uh, Mass Ave that is now the Novartis uh, company. Um, and uh, it was at the time, I think, the largest candy factory uh, in, in America, or at least that was is its claim. Uh, some of the candy industry was based in Boston and, and this area because of the availability of sugar from the triangle trade uh, with you know, the West Indies. So there's a lot of sort of, how did this get here? And when you look, you know, it, it's related to uh, shipping and, and slave trade and a lot of other things. But basically, um, by the mid 20th century, uh, the manufacturing uh, was cheaper to do on sort of single story suburban lots that were closer, in, in many cases in the Midwest, to the supplies of corn syrup or other raw ingredients that Boston really didn't have a leg up in, in being, you know, uh, uh, close to. So a lot of the candy factories that existed in Cambridge, and there were dozens, dozens I, I forget the exact number off the top of my head, but many, many, you know, the Junior Mints Factory is still there on Main Street, right down the street it. from 700 Main. Um, it's the sort of last uh, gasp of the candy industry in Cambridge, but it was a major center, uh, the Charleston Chew, uh, a number of brands that you might recognize uh, were, were developed uh, and, and manufactured in Cambridge. So, you know, out of NECO comes uh, biotechnology. Is it a happy ending? Um, you know, I guess- It doesn't smell as good. <laughs> um. Um, I'm curious, I feel like innovation is usually formed as like technology and how you thought about, you know, widening that with social innovation, like when you were talking about Mariah uh, Baldwin. Yeah, I mean, we felt strongly, first of all, that we didn't want to focus only on white men, frankly, um, and a lot of the technological innovations, not all of them, but many of them were from white men. Um, and also, as as generalists, as people who are not in the technology field, I guess, primarily, we wanted to take kind of a broader look at innovation. You know, why isn't the highlighter marker an innovation? Why isn't a new form of poetry an innovation? Um, so we we took a very broad view as generalists, naturally as generalists um, also. And I should say a little bit about, about our process. So I'm a journalist. I'm very comfortable talk, interviewing people, um, less comfortable reading history books, I'm allergic to dust and the books make me sneeze. Um, so Mike did a lot of the historical research um, and I orchestrated interviews that we thought would help bring some of these stories to life and, and in, into a more contemporary context. Um, and so that's sort of how we divided the work. So he has a much better grasp of the, the dates and, and the details um, than I do, uh, but uh, and, and really, it was a way to understand. So we've lived in Cambridge since 2001, I guess. Yeah, yeah. early 2001. Uh, you know, so a little more than 20 years. And it was a way for us to just understand the place that we, you know, called home, that we chose to raise our children in. And uh, maybe we have a kind of unique perspective on, on history and place. I'm an architect, uh, uh, but I also have a history degree. Uh, so, you know, we would just run across these plaques and be interested, be curious about why is that plaque there? Who was that person? And what did they contribute to the larger society? And how did all of these things happen in, in one sort of small geographic area? Right. And I was an urban studies major in college. And so how did, how do cities tick and why isn't Cambridge like Camden, New Jersey, for instance, which was also an industrial hub, but has really, really struggled. Um, Right, you know, there are kind of more examples of kind of uh, dying know, decaying <laughs> post-industrial cities in America than there are successful post-industrial cities. So that kind of uh, is a, a curious question for us. Um, so I just want to make sure nobody in the room has any questions, but. Oh. So I'll, I'll, I wanted to follow up on your comment about Camden, New Jersey. I was wondering if you could follow up. So what what is there about Cambridge that's different from a one right. of the many dying industrial cities. So the last chapter of our book, to pitch our book just one last time, um, we tried to step back and say, you know, what lessons have we learned from this 
weird and circuitous exploration of this uh, city we, we call home. Um, and we came up with, I think, eight different uh, things that, you know, what is the special sauce of Cambridge? And I think, as Gavin mentioned, you know, one of those is, is clearly money. Uh, you know, whether it's a combination of government funding or venture capital uh, or philanthropy, you know, Harvard and M MIT obviously draw, uh, you know, money, uh, but also the businesses that have spawned here, you know, have, have drawn money. But it's also a willingness. Um, we talk about the role of, of density and diversity. So Cambridge is a particularly physically dense environment um, uh, in terms of its population living in a fairly small area and the interactions that happen casually between people you run into people and so the urban qualities of of the city have uh, uh, an impact on on innovation you come up with ideas that you you know didn't wouldn't have had in if you were just sitting in your in your office by yourself. Robin Chase, who, who Mike mentioned earlier, is one example of that. So she met Angie Danielson on the playground while their kids were playing. They went to a coffee house together and and she she talked to us about how Cambridge was the perfect place to start Zipcar because having a car is expensive and a pain in the neck to park. Um, so many people didn't want certainly to have two cars, but sometimes as she said in her own life, her husband would take the car for work and she'd need to take the kids to the doctor and she needed a car. And so it came out of her own life, but also she knew that other people would be in the same circumstance. So Cambridge was the right size and had the right needs um, for that. And then we also talk about people bumping into each other in Cambridge. It's a small town at, at a certain level also. And so ideas get, get passed around and get shared that way. Right. Um... Uh, again, I think one of the other uh, things we focused on was just the sense of social mission that many people uh, we wrote about have. In other words, like um, Baldwin. Uh, uh, Baldwin for certain, but even in the technology sphere or in the in the healthcare sphere, you know, I think there's this idea that uh, if you want to start a technology company, you have to go to Silicon Valley. And some of the people we talked to uh, in Cambridge started their companies here because they were harder problems that it wasn't simply about writing an app that, you know, uh, would, you know, uh, facilitate e-commerce e or something. It was, it was about, you know, accelerating all web content on the internet, which a company called Akamai in Cambridge does, uh, which is a particularly challenging thing. Um, or it's about solving rare diseases, you know, so that people have had a, a sense of, of, of commitment to hard problems here that I think uh, is, is unique about uh, the innovation uh, ecosystem. And we talk about Robert Langer, Bob Langer at MIT, who uh, talks about when he graduated from um, with his PhD from MIT in chemical engineering, he got offered, I think, four offers from Exxon alone that the oil industry was desperate for brains like his and, and offered him a job. And he could have spent his life maximizing profits for Exxon, and he didn't want to do that. And he went instead and is essentially a founder of bio and the field of bioengineering, among other fields. Um, and because he wanted to, he had a social, a social mission beyond just making somebody else money. And I think that's something that we saw again and again as people, as I mentioned with Baldwin, weren't just about self advancement, but wanted to help other people in the process. And then I guess the sort of elephant in the room uh, is it happens to host uh, two of the most renowned uh, institutions of higher education in the world, and people who, you know, get that education, uh, it benefits not only them individually, but it benefits the, the community they live in and the society they live in. Uh, we talked to uh, Barry Bluestone, who's a, a retired professor from Northeastern, uh, Northeastern uh, who talked about you know, the role that, uh, say, academics have had in advising city government or the kind of the close relationships that have helped to make you know, innovative policies um, a thing here where they might be uh, somewhere else uh, less uh, important. So, you know, education is, is allows people to think nimbly and flexibly about adap adapting to an uncertain future. So, you know, maybe instead of the idea you started out with, you do something else. And uh, so, you know, again, education is, is definitely a big piece of 
Okay, well, I wanna thank you very much for our wonderful presentation. I also would like to just say that uh, we met first uh, on a innovation trail tour. So I'm gonna put a shameless plug in Excellent. for the Boston Cambridge Innovation Trail, which is a new idea coming online and it has a Twitter. website has a website. Uh, and so I would like to say we have books available in the lobby. Uh, and uh, anyone joining us online, I hope that you will uh, consider buying a copy of this book uh, and supporting our authors. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.